Chapter 15 Pramaya Jiva Tattva The next day, Brajanath reached Shiva Sangha earlier than on previous days. The Vaishnavas from Godruma had also come before evening to take darshan of Sandhya Arti, and Sri Premdas Paramahamsa Babaji, Vaishnav Das, Advaita Das, and other Vaishnavas were already seated in the Arti Mandap. When Brajanath saw the barbs of the Vaishnavas from Godruma, he was struck with wonder and thought, I will perfect my life by having their association as soon as possible. When those Vaishnavas saw his humble and devotional disposition, all of them bestowed their blessings on Brajanath. When Arti was over, Brajanath and the elderly Babaji began to walk southwards together in the direction of Godrum. Raghunath Das Babaji saw an incessant stream of tears flowing from Brajanath's eyes, and feeling very affectionate towards him, asked lovingly, Baba, why are you weeping? Brajanath said, Prabhu, when I remember your sweet instructions, my heart becomes restless, and the entire world seems to be devoid of all substance. My heart is becoming eager to take shelter of Sri Gauranga Dev's lotus feet. Please be merciful to me, and tell me who I really am, according to Tattva, and why I have come to this world. Babaji My dear son, you have blessed me by asking such a question. The day that the jiva first asked this question is the auspicious day on which his good fortune arises. If you will kindly hear the fifth shloka of Dashamula, all your doubts will be dispelled. Spurlinga rid agne iva, chid anavo jivat nichaya, harer suryas yaiva pratag, api tutad beda vishaya, vashe maya yasya prakriti, pate e veshvara iha, sajivo mukto pi prakriti, vashayog yasva gunata. Just as many tiny sparks burst out from a blazing fire, so the innumerable jivas are like atomic spiritual particles in the rays of the spiritual sun, Sri Hari. Though these jivas are non-different from Sri Hari, they are also eternally different from him. The eternal difference between the jiva and Ishvara is that Ishvara is the lord and master of Maya Shakti, whereas the jiva can fall under the control of Maya even in his liberated stage due to his constitutional nature. Brajanath, this is an exceptional siddhanta. I would like to hear some Vedic evidence to support it. Sri Bhagavan's statements are certainly Veda, but still, people will be bound to accept the teachings of Mahaprabhu if the Upanishads can substantiate this principle. Babaji, this tattva is described in many places in the Vedas. I will cite a few of them. Yatag Nekshudra Vishpulinga Vyucharanti Brihat Aranyaka Upanishad 2.1.20 Innumerable jivas emanate from Parabrahma, just like tiny sparks from a fire. Tasya va etasya purushasya dveeva stane Bhavata idancha paraloka stanamcha Sandhyam tritiyam svapnastanam Tasmin sandye stane, tishtan ete ube, stane pasyati dancha, paraloka stanan cha. Brihat Aranyaka Upanishad 4.3.9 There are two positions about which the Jiva Purush should inquire, the inanimate material world and the spiritual world. The Jiva is situated in a third position, which is a dreamlike condition, swapna stan and is the juncture, tatasta, between the other two. Being situated at the place where the two worlds meet, he sees both the Jad-Jagat, inert world, and the Chid-Jagat, spiritual world. This shloka describes the marginal nature of Jiva-Shakti. Again it is said in the Brihat Aranyaka Upanishad 4.3.18 Tadyata Mahamatsya Ube Kule Nusancharati Puruvan chaparan chaivan, evayam purusha etav ubav antav, anu sancharati, swapnantan cha budantan cha. 
just as a large fish in a river sometimes goes to the eastern bank and sometimes to the western bank, so the jiva, being situated in Karanajal, the water of cause that lies between the inert and conscious worlds, also gradually wanders to both banks, the place of dreaming and the place of wakefulness. Brajanath, what is the Vedantic meaning of the word tatasta? Babaji, the space between the ocean and the land is called the tata, shore, but the place that touches the ocean is actually nothing but land, so where is the shore? The tata is the line of distinction separating the ocean and the land, and it is so fine that it cannot be seen with the gross eyes. If we compare the transcendental realm to the ocean and the material world to the land, then tata is the subtle line that divides the two, and the jiva shakti is situated at the place where the two meet. The jivas are like the countless atomic particles of light within the sun rays. Being situated in the middle place, the jivas see the spiritual world on one side and the material universe created by maya on the other. Just as Bhagavan's spiritual shakti on one side is unlimited, maya shakti on the other side is also very powerful. The innumerable subtle shushukshma jivas are situated between these two. The jivas are marginal by nature because they have manifested from Krishna's tatasta shakti, marginal potency. Rajanath, what is the tatasta svabhav, marginal nature? Babaji, it is the nature that enables one to be situated between both worlds and to see both sides. Tatasta svabhav is the eligibility to come under the control of either of the shaktis. Sometimes the shore is submerged in the river because of erosion, and then again becomes one with the land because the river changes its course. If the jiva looks in the direction of Krishna, that is, towards the spiritual world, he is influenced by Krishna Shakti. He then enters the spiritual world and serves Bhagavan in his pure conscious spiritual form. However, if he looks towards Maya, he becomes opposed to Krishna and is incarcerated by Maya. This dual faceted nature is called the Tatasta Svabhav, marginal nature. Prajanath. Is there any material component in the jiva's original constitution? Babaji, no. The jiva is created solely from the chit shakti. He can be defeated, that is covered by maya, because he is minute by nature and lacks spiritual power. But there is not even a scent of maya in the jiva's existence. Rajanath, I have heard from my teacher that when a fraction of the conscious Brahman is covered by Maya, it becomes the Jiva. He explained the sky to be always the indivisible Maha Akash, but when a part of it is enclosed in a pot, it becomes Gata Akash. Similarly, the Jiva is originally Brahman, but when that Brahman is covered by Maya, the false ego of being a Jiva develops. Is this conception correct? Babaji this doctrine is only Mayavad. How can Maya touch Brahman? The Mayavadis propose that Brahman has no Shakti, Lupta Shakti. So how can Maya, which is a Shakti, possibly approach Brahman, if Shakti is supposed to be non-existent? The conclusion is that Maya cannot possibly cover Brahman and cause such a miserable condition. Conversely, if we accept the transcendental Shakti, Parashakti, of Brahman, how can Maya, which is an insignificant Shakti, defeat the Chit Shakti and create the Jiva from Brahman? Besides, Brahman is indivisible, so how can such a Brahman be divided? The idea that Maya can act upon Brahman is not acceptable. Maya plays no role in the creation of the Jivas. Admittedly, the Jiva is only atomic, but even so, it is still superior as a Tattva to Maya. Brajanath once another teacher said that the jiva is nothing but a reflection of Brahman. The sun is reflected in water, and similarly, Brahman becomes jiva when it is reflected in maya. Is this conception correct? Babaji, 
Again, this is simply another example of Mayavad philosophy. Brahman has no limits, and a limitless entity can never be reflected. The idea of limiting Brahman is opposed to the conclusions of the Vedas, so this theory of reflection is to be rejected. Brajanath A Digvijay Sanyasi once told me that in reality there is no substance known as jiva. One only thinks of himself as a jiva because of illusion, and when the illusion is removed, there is only one indivisible Brahman. Is this correct or not? Babaji This is also Mayavad doctrine, which has no foundation at all. According to Shastra, Ekam Evad Vitbyam, there is nothing apart from Brahman. If there is nothing except Brahman, where has the illusion come from? And who is supposed to be in illusion? If you say that Brahman is in illusion, you are saying that Brahman is not actually Brahman. Rather, it is insignificant. And if you propose that the illusion is a separate and independent element, you negate the undivided oneness, Advaya Gyan, of Brahman. Brajanath Once an influential Brahmana Pandit arrived in Navadvip, and in a conference of intellectuals, he established that only the jiva exists. His theory was that this jiva creates everything in his dreams, and it is because of this that he enjoys happiness and suffers distress. Then when the dream breaks, he sees that he is nothing but Brahman. To what extent is this idea correct? Babaji This is again Mayavad. If, as they say, Brahman is undifferentiated. How can it possibly produce the jiva and his dreaming state? Mayavadis use examples such as the illusion of seeing mother of pearl in an oyster shell as gold and the illusion of taking a rope to be a snake. But their philosophy cannot provide a consistent basis for Advaya Gyan. Brajanath So Maya has nothing whatever to do with creating the swarup of the jivas. This has to be accepted. At the same time, I have also clearly understood that the jiva is by nature subject to the influence of maya. Now, I want to know, did the chit shakti create the jivas and give them their tatashta swabhav, marginal nature? Babaji, no, the chit shakti is paripurna shakti, the complete potency of Krishna, and its manifestations are all eternally perfect substances. The jiva is not Nityasiddha, although when he performs sadhan, he can become sadhana siddha and enjoy transcendental happiness like the Nityasiddhas, eternally perfect beings. All the four types of Srimati Radhika's Sakis are Nityasiddha, and they are all direct expansions Kayavyuha of the Chit Shakti, Srimati Radhika herself. All the jivas, on the other hand, have manifested from Sri Krishna's Jiva Shakti. The Chit Shakti is Sri Krishna's complete Shakti, whereas the Jiva Shakti is his incomplete Shakti. Just as the complete Tattvas are all transformations of the complete potency, similarly innumerable atomic conscious Jivas are transformations of the incomplete Shakti. Sri Krishna, being established in each of his Shaktis, manifests his Swarup according to the nature of that Shakti. When he is situated in the Chit Swarup, he manifests his Swarup as Sri Krishna and also as Narayan, the Lord of Paravyoma. When he is situated in the Jiva Shakti, he manifests his Swarup as his Vilas Murti of Braj, Baladev. And being established in the Maya Shakti, he manifests the three Vishnu forms, Karan Dokshai, Shira Dokshai, and Garba Dokshai. In his Krishna form in Braj, he manifests all the spiritual affairs to the superlative degree. In his Baladev Swarup, as Shesha Tattva, he manifests Nitya Mukta Parsad Jivas, eternally liberated associates, who render eight types of service to Krishna, Sheshi Tattva Swarup, the origin of Shesha Tattva. Again, as Shesha Rup, Sankarshan in Paravyom, he manifests eight types of servants to render eight kinds of services as eternally liberated associates of Sheshi Rup Narayan. Mahavishnu, who is an avatar of Sankarshan, situates himself 
in the Jiva Shakti, and in his Paramatma Swarup he manifests the Jivas who have the potential to be involved in the material world. These Jivas are susceptible to the influence of Maya, and unless they attain the shelter of the Hladini Shakti, of the Chit Shakti, by Bhagavan's mercy, the possibility of their being defeated by Maya remains. The countless conditioned Jivas who have been conquered by Maya are subordinate to the three modes of material nature. Bearing all this in mind, the Siddhanta is that it is only the Jiva Shakti and not the Chit Shakti that manifests the Jivas. Brajanath, you said earlier that the Chit world is eternal, and so are the Jivas. If this is true, how can an eternal entity possibly be created, manifested, or produced? If it is created at some point of time, it must have been non-existent before that. So how can we accept that it is eternal? Babaji, the time and space that you experience in this material world are completely different from time and space in the spiritual world. Material time is divided into three aspects, past, present, and future. However, in the spiritual world, there is only one undivided, eternally present time. Every event of the spiritual world is eternally present. Whatever we say or describe in the material world is under the jurisdiction of material time and space. So when we say the jivas were created, the spiritual world was manifested, or there is no influence of maya in creating the form of the jivas, material time is bound to influence our language and our statements. This is inevitable in our conditioned state, so we cannot remove the influence of material time from our descriptions of the atomic jiva and spiritual objects. The conception of past, present and future always enters them in some way or another. Still, those who can discriminate properly can understand the application of the eternal present when they comprehend the purport of the descriptions of the spiritual world. Baba, be very careful in this matter. Give up the inevitable baseness or the aspect of the description that is fit to be rejected and have spiritual realization. All Vaishnavas say that the Jiva is an eternal servant of Krishna, that his eternal nature is to serve Krishna, and that he is now bound by Maya because he has forgotten that eternal nature. However, everyone knows that the Jiva is an eternal entity, of which there are two types, Nitya Mukta and Nitya Bada. The subject has been explained in this way only because the conditioned human intellect being controlled by Pramada, inattentiveness, is unable to comprehend a subject matter. Realized sadhaks, though, experience transcendental truth through their chit samadhi. Our words always have some material limitation, so whatever we say will have some mayak defects. My dear son, you should always endeavor to realize the pure truth. Logic and argument cannot help at all in this regard, so it is futile to use them to try to understand inconceivable subject matters. I know that you will not be able to understand these subjects in a moment, but as you cultivate these transcendental moods within your heart, you will realize Chin Mai Bhav more and more. In other words, all the transcendental moods will manifest themselves in the core of your purified heart. Your body is material, and all the activities of your body are also material, but the essence of your being is not material. You are an atomic conscious entity. The more you know yourself, the more you will be able to realize how your Swarup is a tattva superior to the world of Maya. Even if I tell you, you will not realize it, or simply by hearing, you will not attain it. Cultivate the practice of chanting Hari Nam as much as possible. As you go on chanting Hari Nam, these transcendental bhavs will begin to manifest in your heart automatically, and to the degree that they do so, you will be able to realize the transcendental world. Mind and speech both have their origin in matter, and they cannot touch the transcendental truth, even with the greatest endeavor. 
The Vedas say in the Taittiriya Upanishad 2.9, Yato vachar nivartante apariya manasa saha. The speech and the mind returned from Brahman, being unable to attain him. I advise you not to inquire about this matter from anyone, but to realize it yourself. I have just given you an indication, a bas. Brajanath, you have explained that the jiva is like a spark of burning fire or an atomic particle in the rays of the spiritual sun. What is the role of jiva shakti in this? Babaji, Krishna, who in these examples is compared to the blazing fire or the sun, is a self-manifest tattva. Within the compass of that blazing fire or sun, in other words, Krishna, everything is a spiritual manifestation, and the rays spread far and wide beyond its sphere. These rays are the fractional function, anukarya, of the swarup shakti, and the rays within that fractional function are paramanu, atomic particles of the spiritual sun. The jivas are compared to this very localized atomic tattva. Swarup Shakti manifests the world within the sphere of the spiritual sun, and the function outside the sphere of the sun is carried out by Jiva Shakti, which is the direct partial representation of Chit Shakti. Therefore, the activities related to the jiva are those of Jiva Shakti, Parasya Shaktiya Vivaidava Suryate, Shvetasvatara Upanishad 6.8. That Achintya Shakti is called Parashakti. Although it is one, this innate potency, Svabhaviki Shakti, has manifold varieties based on Gyan, spiritual knowledge, Bala, spiritual strength, and Kriya, spiritual activities. According to this aphorism of Shruti, the Chit Shakti is a manifestation of Parashakti. It emanates from its own sphere, the spiritual realm, as the Jiva Shakti, and in the marginal region, between the spiritual and the material worlds, it manifests innumerable eternal Jivas, who are like atomic particles in the rays of the spiritual sun. Brajanath, a burning fire, the sun, sparks, and the atomic particles of sunshine, these are all material objects. Why has a comparison been made with these material objects in the discussion of Chit-Tattva. Babaji, as I have already said, inevitably there are material defects in any material statements we make about Chit-Tattva, but what alternatives do we have? We are obliged to use these examples because we are helpless without them. Therefore, those who know Tattva try to explain Chit-Vastu by comparing it to fire or the sun. In reality, Krishna is far superior to the sun. Krishna's effulgence is far superior to the radiance of the sun. And Krishna's rays and the atoms in them, that is the jiva shakti and the jivas, are far superior to the rays of the sun and the atomic particles in the rays. Still, these examples have been used because there are many similarities within them. Examples can explain some of the spiritual qualities but not all. The beauty of the sun's light and the ability of its rays to illuminate other objects are both qualities that compare to the chit-tattva, for it is the quality of spirit to reveal its own beauty and to illuminate other objects. However, the scorching heat in the sun rays has no counterpart in the chit-vastu, nor does the fact that the rays are material. Again, if we say, this milk is like water. We are only considering the liquid quality of water in the comparison. Otherwise, if all the qualities of water were present in milk, why would the water not become milk? Examples can explain certain specific qualities of an object, but not all of its qualities and traits. Rajanath The spiritual rays of the transcendental Krishna sun and the spiritual atoms within those rays are non-different from the sun, yet at the same time they are eternally different from it. How can both these facts be true simultaneously? Babaji In the material world, when one object is produced from another, 
Either the product is completely different from its source, or else it remains a part of it. This is the nature of material objects. For example, an egg becomes separate from the mother bird once it is laid, whereas a person's nails and hair remain part of the body until they are cut, even though they are produced from his body. However, the nature of Chidvastu is somewhat different. Whatever has manifested from the spiritual sun is simultaneously one with it and different from it. The rays of the sun and the atomic particles in the rays are not separate from the sun, even after they have emanated from it. Similarly, the rays of Krishna's Swarup and the atoms in those rays, that is Jiva Shakti and the Jivas, are not separate from him, even though they are produced from him. At the same time, Although the jivas are non-different from Krishna, they are also eternally different and separate from him, because they have their own minute particle of independent desires. Therefore, the jiva's difference and non-difference from Krishna is an eternal truth. This is the special feature of the chit realm. The sages give a partial example from our experience of inert matter. Suppose you cut a small piece of gold from a large piece and use it to make a bangle. From the perspective of the gold, the bangle is not different from the original piece of gold. They are non-different. However, from the perspective of the bangle, the two are different from each other. This example is not a completely correct representation of Chittattva, but it illustrates an important aspect. From the point of view of Chittattva, there is no difference between Ishvara and the Jiva, whereas from the perspective of state and quantity, these two are eternally different. Ishvara is complete Chit, whereas the Jiva is atomic Chit. Ishvara is great, whereas the Jiva is insignificant. Some people give the example of Gata Akash and Maha Akash, the sky in a pot and the unlimited sky, in this regard but this example is completely inconsistent with regard to Chittattva. Brajanath If transcendental entities and material objects belong to completely different categories, how can material objects be used as appropriate examples for understanding transcendental entities? Babaji There are different categories of material objects, and the pandits of the Naya school consider them eternal. However, there is no such categorical difference between the chit, transcendental, and jud, material. I have already said that chit is the only reality, and jud is simply its transformation, vikar. The vikar is different from the original source, but it is still similar to the pure original object in many respects. For example, Ice is a transformation of water, and it becomes different from water through this transformation. But the two remain similar in many of their qualities, such as coldness. Hot and cold water do not both have the quality of coldness, but their quality of fluidity is the same. Therefore, the transformed object certainly retains some similarity to the pure object. According to this principle, the transcendental chit world can be understood to some extent with the help of material examples. Again, by adopting the logic of Arundhata Darshan, one can use material examples to understand something about the spiritual nature. Footnote Arundhati is a very small star which is situated close to the Vashista star in the Saptarishi constellation, the Great Bear. In order to view it, its location is first determined by looking at a bigger star beside it. Then if one looks carefully, one can see Arundhati close by. Similarly, the Madhyam Adhikari, although taking help from the senses and the language of the material world in describing the spiritual world, realizes and sees the Aprakat Tattva after having applied the Anjan, ointment of Prem, to the eyes of Bhakti. End of footnote. Krishna's pastimes are completely spiritual, 
and there is not even the slightest scent of a material mood in them. The Braj Leela described in Srimad Bhagavatam is transcendental, but when the descriptions are read in an assembly, the fruits of hearing them are different according to the respective qualifications of the various listeners. Appreciating the ornamental figures of speech from the mundane perspective, those who are absorbed in material sense gratification hear it as a story of an ordinary hero and heroine. The Madhyam Adhikaris take shelter of Arundhati Darshan Nyaya and experience the transcendental pastimes, which are similar to mundane descriptions. And when the Uttam Adhikari Bhaktas hear the descriptions of those pastimes, they become absorbed in the rasa of pure transcendental chidvilas, which is above all mundane qualities. The absolute truth is aprakrit tattva, so how can we educate the jivas about it without taking help of the principles that I have just described? Can the conditioned jiva understand a subject that renders the voice dumb and stops the working of the mind? There doesn't appear to be any method of explaining these subjects other than the principle of similarity and the logic of Arundhati Darshan. Material objects can be either different or non-different from each other, so difference and non-difference are not visible in them at one and the same time. But this is not the case with Paramatattva. We have to accept that Krishna is simultaneously different and non-different from his Jiva Shakti and from the Jivas in it. This Beda Bed Tattva simultaneous difference and oneness is said to be achintya, inconceivable, because it is beyond the limit of human intellect. Brajanath, what is the difference between Ishvara and the Jiva? Babaji, first you should understand the non-difference between Ishvara and the Jiva, and after that I will explain their eternal difference. Ishvara is the embodiment of knowledge, Gyanswarup, the knower, Nataswarup, one who considers or reflects, Mantaswarup, and the enjoyer, Bhaktriswarup. He is self-effulgent, Svaprakash, and he also illuminates others, Paraprakash. He has his own desires, Ichamayi, and he is the knower of all, Ketragya. The Jiva, too, is the form of knowledge, the knower, and the enjoyer. He too is self-effulgent, and he illuminates others. And he too has desires, and is the knower of his own field, Ketragya. From this perspective, there is no difference between them. However, Ishwara is omnipotent, and by dint of his omnipotence, he is the basis of all these qualities which are present in him in full. These qualities are also present in the atomic jiva, but only to a minute degree. Thus the nature and form of Ishwara and the jiva are eternally different from each other, because one is complete and the other is minute. And at the same time, there is a lack of distinction between Ishwara and the jiva because of the similarity between their qualities. Ishwara is the lord of Swarup Shakti, Jiva Shakti and Maya Shakti, because of the completeness of the internal potency, Atma Shakti. Shakti is his maidservant, and he is the Lord of Shakti, who is activated by his desire. This is the Swarup of Ishwara. Though the qualities of Ishwara are present in the Jiva to a minute degree, the Jiva is nonetheless under the control of Shakti. The word Maya has been used in Dashamula not only to indicate material Maya, but also to indicate Swarup Shakti. Miyate Anya Iti Maya. Maya is that by which things can be measured. The word Maya refers to the Shakti that illuminates Krishna's identity in all the three worlds, namely the Chit Jagat, Achit Jagat, and Jiva Jagat. Krishna is the controller of Maya, and the Jiva is under the control of Maya. Therefore it is said, in the Svetashvatara Upanishad 4.9.10 Asman Mayi Shrijate Vishvam Etat Tasmims Chanyo Mayaya Sani Rudaha Mayan Tuprakritim Vidyan 
Mayenam tu Maheshwaram, Tasya Vaya Bhutais tu, Vyaptang Sarvam Medam Jagat. Parameshwara is the Lord of Maya. He has created the entire world, wherein the jivas are bound in the illusion of material identification. It should be understood that Maya is his Prakriti, and he is Maheshwara, the controller of Maya. This entire world is pervaded by his limbs. In this mantra, the word Mayi is used to indicate Krishna, the controller of Maya, and Prakriti is used to indicate the complete Shakti. His great qualities and nature are the special characteristics of Ishwara. They are not present in the Jiva, and he cannot attain them, even after liberation. It is stated in Brahma Sutra 4.4.17, Jagatvya Para Varjam, the creation, maintenance, and control of the entire transcendental and inert world is the work of Brahman only and no one else. Except for this activity in relation to the Chit and Achit worlds, all other activities are possible for liberated jivas. The Shruti states, Yato va imani bhutani jayante, Taitariya Upanishad 3.1 he is that by which all the jivas are created and maintained, and into which they enter and become unmanifest at the time of annihilation. These statements have only been made in relation to Brahman, and they cannot be applied to the jiva by any amount of manipulation, because there is no reference to liberated jivas here. The Shastras state that it is only Bhagavan, and not the liberated jiva, who performs activities of creation, maintenance and annihilation. One may suppose that the jiva can also perform these activities, but this gives rise to the philosophy of many Ishwaras, Bahu Ishwaravad, which is defective. Therefore, the correct Siddhanta is that the jiva is not qualified for the above-mentioned activities even when liberated. This establishes the eternal difference between the jiva and Ishwara and all learned people support this. This difference is not imaginary, but eternal. It does not disappear in any state of the jiva. Consequently, the statement that the jiva is an eternal servant of Krishna should be accepted as a fundamental statement, Mahavakya. Rajanath If one can only prove the eternal difference between Ishvara and the jiva, how can one accept the oneness? Another point is that if there is oneness, do we have to accept a state of merging with Ishwara, Nirvana? Babaji, no, not at all. The jiva is not one with Krishna at any stage. Rajanath, then why have you spoken about Achintya Beda Beda, inconceivable oneness and difference? Babaji, from the perspective of Chit Dharma, there is no difference between Krishna and the jivas, but constitutionally, Swarup, there is eternal difference between them. Despite the eternal non-difference, it is the perception of difference that is eternally prominent. Though the Abhayad Swarup is an accomplished fact, there is no indication that any such state has independent existence. Rather, it is the manifestation of Nitya Bhayad, eternal difference, that is always prominent. In other words, where eternal difference and eternal oneness are present simultaneously, the perception of Bade is stronger. For example, let us say the owner of a house is called Devadatta. His house is simultaneously Adevadatta, independent of Devadatta, and Sadevadatta, identified with Devadatta. Even though from some points of view, it may be considered independent of Devadatta, still its specific characteristic of being identified with Devadatta eternally exists. Similarly, in the case of Ishwara and the Jivas, non-difference or oneness is not part of the essential identity, even at the stage of Swarup Siddhi. Just as the house can be called both Adevadatta and Sadevadatta, from one perspective, it may be viewed as Adevadatta, but still the real identity is Sadevadatta, identified with Devadatta. 
Let me give you another example from the material world. Sky is a material element, and there is also a basis for its existence. But even though the basis is present, only the sky is actually visible. Similarly, even within the Abade existence, the distinctive Nitya Bade, which is real, is found. And that is why Nitya Bade is the only definitive characteristic of the essential reality, Vastu. Rajanath, please explain the eternal nature of the Jiva even more clearly. Babaji, the Jiva is atomic consciousness and is endowed with the quality of knowledge and is described by the word Aham, I. He is the enjoyer, the thinker, and the one who comprehends. The jiva has an eternal form, which is very subtle, just as the different parts of the gross body, the hands, legs, nose, eyes, and so on, combine to manifest a beautiful form when established in the respective places. Similarly, a very beautiful atomic spiritual body is manifest, which is composed of different spiritual parts. However, when the jiva is entangled in maya, that spiritual form is covered by two material bodies. One is called the subtle body, linga sarir, and the other is called the gross body, stula sarir. The subtle body, which is the first to cover the atomic spiritual body, is unavoidable from the beginning of the jiva's conditioned state until his liberation. When the jiva transmigrates, from one body to the next, the gross body changes, but the subtle body does not. Rather, as the jiva leaves the gross body, the subtle body carries all its karmas and desires to the next body. The jiva's change of body and transmigration are carried out through the science of Panchagni, the five fires, which are delineated in the Vedas. The system of Panchagni, such as the funeral fire, the fire of digestion and rain has been described in the Chandogya Upanishad and Brahma Sutra. The jiva's conditioned nature in the new body is the result of the influences of his previous births, and this nature determines the varna in which he takes birth. After entering Varnashram, he begins to perform karma again, and when he dies, he repeats the same process. The first covering of the eternal spiritual form is the subtle body, and the second is the gross body. Brajanath, what is the difference between the eternal spiritual body and the subtle body? Babaji, the eternal body is the actual original body, and it is atomic, spiritual, and faultless. This is the real object of the ego, the real I. The subtle body arises from contact with matter, and it consists of three vitiated transformations, namely of the mind, intelligence, and ego. Brajanath, are mind, intelligence, and ego material entities? If they are, how do they have the qualities of knowledge and activity? Babaji, Bumia apo nalo vayu, kangmano budia eva cha. Ahankara iti yam me, bina prakritir astada, apare yam mitastvan yam, prakritim vidi me param, jiva bhutam mahabaho, ya ye dam daryate jagat, etad yonini bhutani, sarvanityu padaraya, aham kritsnasya jagataha, prabhava pralayastata. Bhagavad Gita 7 4 to 6 my separated eightfold apara, or maya prakriti, consists of the five gross elements, earth, water, fire, air, and space, and the three subtle elements, mind, intelligence, and false ego. Besides this, O mighty armed Arjuna, I have a tatasta prakriti, which can also be called para prakriti, superior nature. That prakriti is in the form of consciousness and the jivas, all the jivas who have manifested from this paraprakriti make the inert world full of consciousness. The jiva shakti is called tatashta because it is eligible for both worlds, the spiritual world, which is manifest from my antaranga shakti, 
and the material world, which is manifest from my Bahiranga Shakti. Since all created entities are manifested from these two types of Prakriti, you should know that I, Bhagavan, am the sole original cause of creation and destruction of all the worlds of the moving and non-moving beings. These shlokas of Gita Upanishad describe the two types of Prakriti of Sarva Shaktiman Bhagavan. One is called Paraprakriti, the superior energy, and the other is called Aparaprakriti, the inferior energy. They are also known as Jiva Shakti and Maya Shakti respectively. The Jiva Shakti is called Parashakti or Shrestha Shakti, the superior Shakti because it is full of spiritual atomic particles. The Maya Shakti is called Apara, inferior, because it is material and inert, Jud. The Jiva is a completely separate entity from the Apara Shakti, which contains eight elements, the five gross elements, earth, water, fire, air and space, and the three subtle elements, mind, intelligence and ego. These last three material elements are special. The aspect of knowledge that is visible in them is material and not spiritual. The mind creates a false world by basing its knowledge of sensual objects on the images and influences that it absorbs from gross subjects in the mundane realm. This process has its root in mundane matter, not in spirit. The faculty that relies on that knowledge to discriminate between real and unreal is called intelligence, which also has its root in mundane matter. The ego or sense of I-ness that is produced by accepting the above knowledge is also material and not spiritual. These three faculties together manifest the jiva's second form, which acts as the connection between the jiva and matter and is called the subtle body. Linga Sarira. As the ego of the conditioned Jiva's subtle body becomes stronger, it covers the ego of his eternal form. The ego in the eternal nature, in relationship to the spiritual son, Krishna, is the eternal and pure ego, and this same ego manifests again in the liberated state. However, as long as the eternal body remains covered by the subtle body, the material self conception Jad Abhiman, arising from the gross and subtle body, remains strong, and consequently the Abhiman of relation with spirit is almost absent. The Linga Sarir is very fine, so that the function of the gross body covers it. Thus identification with the caste and so on of the gross body arises in the subtle body because it is covered by the gross body. Although the three elements mind, intelligence and ego are material, the abhiman of knowledge is inherent in them because they are vitiated transformations of the function of the soul, atma vritti. Rajanath, I understand the eternal swarup of the jiva to be spiritual and atomic in nature, and within that swarup is a very beautiful body composed of spiritual limbs. In the conditioned state, that beautiful spiritual body remains covered by the subtle body and the material covering of the jiva swarup in the form of the jad sarir causes its material transformation jad vikar now i want to know whether the jiva is completely faultless in the liberated state babaji the atomic spiritual form is free from defect but because of its minute nature it is inherently weak and therefore incomplete the only defect in that state is that the jiva's spiritual form may be covered through association with the powerful Maya Shakti. It is said in Srimad Bhagavatam 10.2.32 Ye nye ravindaksha vimukta maninas tvayasta bhavad abhishuddha buddhaya aruya krichjena param padam tata patantya do nadrita yusmad angraya O lotus-eyed Lord, non-devotees such as the jnanis, yogis and renunciants falsely consider themselves to be liberated, but their intelligence is not really pure because they lack devotion. 
they perform severe austerities and penances and achieve what they imagine to be the liberated position, but they still fall from there into a very low condition due to neglecting your lotus feet. This shows that the constitution of the jiva will always remain incomplete no matter how elevated a stage the liberated jiva may achieve. That is the inherent nature of jiva tattva, and that is why it is said in the Vedas that Ishwara is the controller of Maya, whereas the jiva remains eligible to be controlled by Maya in all circumstances. Thus ends the fifteenth chapter of Jiva Dharma, entitled Prameya, Jiva Tattva.